interesting. All right, we're rolling. So, it's your old friend Hangry Cat here again, and uh, I'm talking with Brendan Hunter. Hey, Sebastian, how are you? Good, good. Thanks for the intro back there. A clean father, I like that. <laughs> well, we do the best we can. Yeah. Father hurts hard. Well, and you know, that's one of the things why I like talking to you, because you kind of find that balance between, like, doing the stuff in the, in the industry and being a family man, and that's inspiring to me, because, you know, you've got a couple of years on me. So, how old are you now? Well, my oldest will be six in May, um, and she was actually uh, just a, a newborn when we started Lloyd the Conqueror way back when. So, this has been, you know, a con constant is as we tried to do bigger and larger projects it was with the intent that we were creating a financial revenue stream for you know for for ages to come and as as parents and as artists and self-employed people that was paramount to me but it was not worth it at the expense you know you see a lot of people who give too much to their their craft or their industry and they end up losing their family yeah. um, that's that's a tragedy and it makes it all um, moot in my opinion you can create great things uh, for other people's enjoyment but if you lose your own livelihood or enjoyment from it then uh, that's not that's not what I'm prepared to give it's not worth it at the end of the day not for me no 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 I, I totally agree with you you know um, now I just want to go back to like the first time I bumped into you you were working on we worked up together in that production for APPN Oh wow! That, In a world created by a drunken that's, god. That's the one, yeah. That, yeah, and that was that was a wild a little project. We were out in the boonies. We were fishing and uh, canoeing all over. The, oh, that was that was crazy. That's how long it's been, you know. And I was a young, wet behind the ears AD, didn't really know what I was doing. And we were both young. Yeah. Now look at us. I like that. Yeah, I know. The years have taken the toll <laughs> on me for sure. You look well, great. No. I mean, Children just, ages you exponentially, <laughs> and I have three now, so I'm 35. <laughs> Haggard. I, you know, once I had mine, I started getting the gray hairs. Yeah, yeah. Like I had like one or two, three gray hairs during like the Stanley Cup run of 04 when the flames went on it. Yeah. And then like after my boy was born, boom, all over the place. That's why I wear the hat now. I'm, ge honest. I'm getting it all through here, and then I think it's going to go up into like the Mr. Fantastic sideburns. Uh, nice. I'm looking forward to that. Nice, nice. I'm hoping to go for the whole salt and pepper George Clooney look. <laughs> So that's how long I've known you. It's been been a long time. Yeah, yeah. And um, so for that, I've seen you. I've seen you act. I've seen you produce. I've seen you do a whole bunch of things. And you're even doing voiceover. Um, what are you doing here at Expo today? Uh, I was doing a panel on, on voice acting for animation. If you uh, if you look me up, I'm in a lot of uh, dub work from overseas, Japanese, German, French. Um, a lot of people know me from the Dragon Ball series, which was a big part of people's childhood, it seems. Dragon so, Ball, so who, who, who in Dragon Ball? Well, in, in Dragon Ball, I played Tian Shin Han. He's a bald, three-eyed guy. He's a big, muscular, tough guy. And then in Dragon Ball GT, I, I was Oob, the uh, reincarnation of Majin Buu. Uh, a little, just kind of a kid with a, a mohawk, very powerful. And then um, we've we've done some other projects where I've, I've been asked back by production to do Tien for, because there's a whole bunch of chapters of, of Dragon Ball, so it's been a it's been a long term relationship with that franchise, and it seems to be one that the fans tend to never get tired of. I I mean, a lot of that stuff was made in the 80s and 90s, and the dubs happened in the early 2000s, and even more recently with Dragon Ball Z Kai when that came out, we redubbed that as well but um, yeah I mean the, the new movies coming out in Japan like Battle of the Gods did really well uh, that didn't get dubbed up here which would have been really fun but you know it seems like it just has goes on and on but anyways I've, I've been a part of a lot of great shows a lot of great franchises and um, and so yeah I get to tour a bit at comic cons and anime expos and all the rest as a, a voice guest and and we talk about the industry and what uh, what shows have we done and, and what what that experience has been like and I like that I like that, that you you're doing it from here from Calgary because it's not something you expect. Yeah. Hey, anime is happening out of here. You know, yeah. that's something that you can do out of Calgary, which is not expected. You know, no, it's um, like you almost never meet your directors. They're all in the in the headphones. They're in in Vancouver or Toronto or, or LA or wherever. <coughs> but. The uh, studios are connected, so the, there's, there's Calgary studios that are connected to Vancouver, and so you're part of the same shows that maybe some of your colleagues, uh, and some ex-Calgarians ex as well, have gone out to be in Vancouver and, and be in that scene. I've been fortunate enough to be able to stay here in Calgary, where my family, my home, my community is, and uh, and still get to be a part of these things in a, 
you know, in, in, in some ways leading capacities, which is, I think, rare. And I think, I, I think that's a big part of the education that we get to give in these panels and in these guestings is, I'm really glad you love these shows and you think that they're somehow unattainable or they're, 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 they're done here by people here. Like, we're, we're, we're as gracious and as humble as, as, as the fans are because we get to be a part of it and we see the impact it has on, on the, uh, the patrons here at cons and the, the, the costuming. I mean, you, you, I, I still see Dragon Ball costumes. And I think it needs to get out there. I think the people need to know that this kind of stuff is within their reach, you know? Yeah. Why do I keep talking to people like this? Because I want to push the fact that Calgary has art, has an art scene. We are creating, we're content providers, we're creating a culture. And in know? 2000, I didn't know that. In yeah. 2000, I was in Victoria doing auditions in Vancouver, thinking that's where you have to be. Vancouver, Toronto. And then I kept getting these theater contracts out here in Calgary, and I was like, Calgary, okay, I'd never been here. I, I came here for two and three month stints, go back to Victoria, keep auditioning in Vancouver, thinking I'd eventually move to. Never happened. Kept getting role after role after role. In Calgary. Eventually I said, go where you're wanted. Yeah. And the rest fell into place. Met my wife, met this community, was able to be in productions and be in uh, uh, size and scopes of roles and products that I would have probably never landed in Vancouver because here I was up against 30 people, there I would have been up against 300 people. My ratio was, was, was more controllable. Uh, you know, good work begets good work and, and your community. This is a non-competitive community. I, I, I love that about Calgary's film and uh, theater community. It's really integrated, it's really collaborative, and I can't speak for other centers, but I think it is rare that we have this this really, like, like when I met you, you were an AD. Mm -hmm. And then I saw you and you were doing, I think, uh, you were in a, a different crew capacity, and then you were making your own product. And people would cycle between each other's product, and if they were a director last week, maybe this week, they're just a lighting op, because yeah. they want to help their community make the best possible product because it was benefiting us all. Like the the swell of of, of uh, talent and capacity out of Calgary was was all integrated. It was all like hand holding, and I thought well, it, that's like, where you want to be. In a tide, all ships rise, right? So it's kind of like let's. Which I think, is. hopefully, isn't an inherently you know localized feeling because I can't speak for other markets, but I, I love the fact that that. Whether it's this industry at large or it's this industry locally, it is like that. It's, hey, I figured out one or two pieces of this puzzle, but it's a huge puzzle. Have you figured out a couple pieces? And we come together and we bring our pieces and we go, well, we don't have the whole picture yet, but we have a little bit more to go on and it benefited us all. So maybe the part, part of that secret is part of making that, that community stronger is to, sh be, to share more of those secrets. Huh? I'm all for that. I, I I know that some people feel very guarded in, in their experience or their knowledge because it does take a lot. You sacrifice a lot to cultivate relationships or, you know, when you get through that first feature film and you didn't realize, you thought it was this big, but it ended up being this big and you just were stretched to your limits and beyond and then you, and then you get through it and you go, well, I learned a lot. That stuff is valuable. To, to everyone, you know, like when I meet with young filmmakers and they go, so I'm producing a project and this, these are my thoughts, I'm like, okay, and you're thinking about it from the, the front end, so you also need to incorporate the back end, where's it going, who's your audience, how is it going to recuperate, it's part of the whole package, yeah, because they think build it and they will come, yeah. we all thought that at one point, mm -hmm. make something great and they will come, very field of dreams but unrealistic, because there's so just an what, oversaturated what, where's, where's market, what's the opposite of that then? To, to understand why you're making the product and where it's going. Because without those reasons, then it's it's just fluff. Like, and we all have an interest in just making stuff, being creative, but if it doesn't have a reason and if it doesn't have an audience, then it will likely never achieve mass dispersal. It, it, won't, it won't get the interest because if you weren't able to target your audience, and, and, and you know what, I'm all for the, the, the shift now with independent filmmaking where it's, it's crowdsourced, it's got a huge component of building your audience at the onset or before the product even gets started. You're, maybe you're even pre-selling a few thousand DVDs. Now that's unheard of when you go and you get distribution to go to Walmart or, or HMV. They buy maybe a thousand DVDs, but they return half of them and you never see much profit from that. So if you can do direct sales for the target niche audience for a thousand or two thousand units, and you can start to structure your financial recoupment against your budget, well, you're ahead of the game 
right off the onset. Yeah. I love that about it. And I, I was, I'm not an uh, I'm not involved with Kung Fury, but if you haven't heard of it, please check it out. Kung Fury was one of the most successful crowdfunded camp movies yeah. I've ever seen. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to it like nobody's business. And I love that about independent film is it chooses its it chooses its own like the, when you see it, you'll understand. But it, it chooses its own niche. It's creating something that's combining a whole bunch of things that they think is cool, making something new out of something old. And I just love the kitsch camp factor, and I know that they've got an audience because they were able to connect with them on the internet, create a huge groundswell of support financially as well as for their marketing purposes. That's not going to always be the case, but you can always source out your audience. Maybe your audience is only 10 people, and then you choose how you're going to present that to those 10 people. You might not spend a million bucks on that one, but if you find 10,000 people, maybe that's the one you can spend a million bucks on.